encouraged to see all of you. If you have a Bible, if you'll keep it open to that last chapter right there, and we're looking at instruction that comes from the Apostle Paul, and this is the end of this book. So we're finishing up 1 Thessalonians. Next week we're going to start in 2 Thessalonians, and we'll probably have, um, uh, probably on Christmas Day, we won't do 2 Thessalonians, probably do something uh, else uh, on the birth of Christ probably. But um, we are at the end of this book, and he's going to write them another letter, and that's 2 Thessalonians, to deal with some things, questions that they have. But these are final directions to this church at Thessalonica from the Apostle Paul. Now, I had some difficulty in, in trying to s determine how I'm, how I'm going to present this. There's so many different things in this last section here, really from verses 19 through the end of the book. One thing that stands out, and I think that we need to see, is this. Th there were... There were set ways on how you finish letters. This is a letter. It's like other letters, all kind of letters that were written. This letter is different in one way, in that it comes, in the important way, that it comes from God. It's God's Word. Yet there, there were set outlines and ways that, that letters ended. Yet Paul changes a little of that. He tweaks a little of that. And the things that he emphasizes, I think, shows... He's doing that on purpose to show that you know how a regular letters end, but he's saying, here's how, here's how this is ending. And he's emphasizing some things. Now that verse, um, the two verses that Jackson read, but verse 23, so it's closing instruction. Verse 23, look there again at that. He says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been seeing over and over. At the end of it, each of these five chapters, Paul mentions the second coming of Christ. And he wants this church to be ready. And God wants this church to be ready when Christ comes. He's coming again. The whole letter has been, keep your eyes on Jesus. He's coming again. And then he says, I want you to be ready. I want you to be blameless at the, the coming. Now, uh, look at verse, we're going to kind of divide this. Verses 19 through 22 are attitudes and ways of acting in regard to teaching, about teaching. And so let's read uh, 19 through 22. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 22. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. So he's talking about how they handle the teachings that they receive. Now these teachings would come from Paul, from the Apostle Paul. We have these teachings in God's Word. And he's talking about how do we receive those? And this falls into two parts. There's negative, don't do this. And then there's positive, do this. And he says, don't reject the negative. Don't reject spirit-inspired prophecy. And then positive, uh, he says that you need to test everything. And once it's tested, you hold on to it. In fact, you hold on to everything that's, that's good. Uh, we might put this kind of like this in an outline. Verse 19, the general, don't quench the spirit. Then he gets a little more specific. He says, don't despise prophecies. Then the general, in verses 21 through 22, is the positive side of this. The general is, test all things. And then he gets more specific. How do you do that? Well, you hold fast to the good and then more specific, you hold yourself, and use the same verb. So you hold fast to the good, and you hold yourselves away from every kind of evil. Now, in the text here, it doesn't say evil prophecy in verse 22, but that may be what he means, because it's in that context. I know that verse, verse 22, reject every kind of evil, or every appearance of evil, maybe some translations have. That's been used in a general way, and in a general way, that's true. We need to guard ourselves and keep ourselves from every kind of evil. But in this context, he's probably talking about evil teachings, evil prophecy. You hold yourselves away from that. And so you, 
don't quench the Spirit because this teaching is coming from the Spirit, and the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. So you don't quench the Spirit, and you don't despise prophecies. And the positive of that, then, is you test all things. So when he says don't quench the Spirit, he means also you don't just accept any kind of teaching that's out there. And that's still true today. Don't just accept any kind of teaching that's out there. You need to hold whoever's teaching you the Bible to the Bible. You need to hold that that person is teaching what God says. And that means all of us, whether you're standing up here or you're sitting there, all of us have a responsibility to spend time learning God's Word. We have, I mean, a, a, I'll tell you this, you know this, a false teacher of God's Word is not going to stand up and say, I'm a false teacher. Don't listen to me. A false teacher is going to say, this is the very Word of God. Well, how do we know? Well, we know by spending time in Scripture. And so Paul says, you test all things. Don't just accept everything that, that comes to you. Once it's tested then, don't walk away from it. You hold yourself to the good. And you hold yourself away from evil. No evil can be allowed in our lives and in our teaching. So that's um, verses 19 through 22. Then look at verses 23 through the end of the chapter. Jackson read 23 and 24, but um, let's go ahead and just read that again and read through the rest of the chapter. So we begin with verse 23. <clears throat> May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So this is the closing. And why does he end with just this flurry, this list of all these commands? And that's the difficulty I've had and, I mean, how do you put this in a sermon? How do you present this as, uh, as a sermon? <clears throat> Paul, again, it comes back. Paul skillfully knows and uses. The, he knows how letters end. But he's ending in a special way, a little bit different from that. But he's emphasizing things he's already told them in the letter. There's some themes that keep coming up, and they've been throughout the letter. He echoing the themes that he's already spent time about these things. And some very strong words that are here. Really the themes that have been through the letter, and now he's, it's like the last time he's going to echo those things, is peace, a call to a holy life, and then comfort about the second coming. Those three things, those are three themes that have been all throughout 1 Thessalonians. Let's talk about these. Peace. Peace. That, and that you've heard the word shalom. That's the Hebrew. And that peace comes from God. God is the source of that peace. And it's not just the resolution of conflict. You have conflict and then, you know, there's peace. It's more than that. It's deeper than that. It has a richer meaning. It's a restoration. It's restoring because our world has changed when sin has entered into the world. We live in a fallen world. And things are not the way they should be. And that's affected all parts of our world. Yet, God in Christ is in the process of restoring everything that's ruined by sin. And I don't, have all, I don't know how all that's going to work out. And I don't have all the answers about that. But in Christ, everything that has been ruined by sin is restored. It's in the process of being restored now. And in the end, that restoration is complete. It's a restoration to its former glory. And it's more than, I mean, God saves us, but it's more than just us individually. It's God is saving everything that he created. Now here, verse 23 God is the one who's going to do that. May God himself, 
who is the God of peace. And so that's God's role in this. God himself restore all of this because he is the God of peace. And it's also the idea that when he says, may the God of peace be with you, it's the idea, may the God of peace give you peace. And you look at our world, there are all kinds of things, you know, at various times, a lot of people don't have peace. And that's that inner peace. <clears throat> Yet God can give that peace. It's peace with each other and it's peace with God. And God himself can give that peace. And tied in with that is, look at verse 23, he sanctify you through and through, completely, to give you peace. You, you can't have and we can't have peace with one another until, until we have peace with God. Now we can, you know, kind of have something that looks sort of like peace and we just get along. Um, as you know, you know, holidays and family gatherings could go, you know, a lot of different ways. And there can be a lot of conflict involved in that. Or there can be an enjoyment of time that's people are off work and they're able to spend some time together and love. But it can go either way. And <clears throat> that conflict that's there, the ultimate source is being apart from God. And so God himself can give that peace. He can give peace in the, in the world. What are the sources of, of war? James says it's your selfishness, it's your sin, it's your fighting with each other. And so in his other letters, like Romans, 1 Corinthians, Paul has a statement, may the God of peace be with you. But he expands that here. And he's echoing the themes. But peace is a main theme throughout this book. Now another theme there, as you see on the slide, is a call to a holy life. <clears throat> Let's go back a little bit uh, to chapter 1, uh, 1 Thessalonians. And so here's the order of ancient letters. You have the person that's writing the letter. So you have the name right there at the beginning, the author. The people that are receiving the letter. That's the recipients, the receivers of the letter. Then you have a greeting. Usually the greeting is grace and peace to you, which would be a greeting that all people, whether they read scripture or not in first century would use greek people use that grace and peace to you <clears throat> yet it's transformed because grace and when paul says grace and peace that means a lot because he's talking about spiritual grace and peace so you have the author the receiver uh, receivers grace and peace the greeting then there is a thanksgiving section paul says i thank god for you and letters followed that format. When people wrote letters, there would be a greeting, or the author, the receivers, the greeting, and then thanksgiving. And then you have the body itself of the letter. And then you have the farewell, or the ending of the letter. So here at the beginning of this letter, chapter 1, you have the thanksgiving, verses 2 through 10. See verse 2, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. And he says, I remember your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The holy lives that they're living, <clears throat> Paul says, that comes from your life in Christ. And he's concerned that that continues. And he says, our gospel came to you and you received it not as just the words of humans, but as the word of God himself. And then this holiness, this call to holy life becomes a major theme later in the letter. And these passages here, go to chapter 4. <clears throat> he says, verse 1, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you're living. Now we ask you, urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Then he gets specific. It is, the, it is God's will that you should be sanctified or live a holy life. That's what sanctified means. What does he mean specifically? Well, he says here, verse, verse 3, that you should avoid sexual immorality. So... It's a call to a holy life. 
<clears throat> now understand this theologically you don't str clean up your life and live a holy life and then come to Christ because you can't clean up your life and live a holy life to come to Christ you come to Christ as a sinner repenting turning from sin and by God's grace you are saved and you are sanctified you are a saint you are now holy in God's eyes but then you're called to live like who you are you're a saint so live like one I've told you many times that's Paul's that's Paul's ethics <clears throat> you live like who you are and a lot of theologians will illustrate it this way uh, say you have two single people um, a man and a woman and they fall in love and they want to get married and so then they marry now they're married they were single now they're married <clears throat> well married people can't live like single people their their status has changed from single to married so married people have to live like married people Paul is saying you used to be apart from Christ now you've come to Christ now you're saints now live like it <clears throat> that you live a holy life that's what you have to do you live like who you are and so it's a call to continually live this holy life and look at uh, chapter 3 verse uh, 13 so he says may God strengthen and this is Paul's prayer may he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy so it's a call to holy life in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones so back here at the end of the letter verse 23 may God himself the God of peace sanctify you through and through that you might live a holy life that you might be ready when he comes so that's echoing that theme that he's already brought up so peace a call to a holy life <clears throat> and then the third main theme that's in this letter is about the second coming every chapter has a reference to the second coming of Christ it's a major theme and there are those who are upset that their loved ones have died and they think well maybe they missed out on this and Paul has to deal with that and then in chapter 5 he says what about those who are alive well he says you need to be ready and you are ready that day will not come as a thief in the night for you in the two main sections about the, the second coming in 1st Thessalonians are chapter 4 and chapter 5 sections of those let's go back there and look at that chapter 4 verse 13 brothers and sisters we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope and we went through this when we discussed this passage and that's on YouTube if you want to watch it again but he's he's not saying that Christians are not to grieve what he is saying is you don't grieve as those who have no hope your grief is transformed by the hope you have in Christ. So that's verse 13. <clears throat> verse 14. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who've fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now notice he doesn't go into all kind of details. He may not answer the questions that we might want to ask of this. But what he does say is the Lord is coming and he's talking about those who died in Christ are not at a disadvantage. And notice the practical purpose of this, the last verse. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Those who died in Christ, those who died as, as Christians, he says, 
they're with the Lord, and he's coming again. So you encourage one another with these words. Now look at chapter 5, verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are, are saying safety or peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. And then notice verse 11. This is that same practical application. Therefore, Encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you're doing. So Paul says a lot about the second coming of Christ. And what he's saying, if you could boil it down, is he's coming and you live holy lives to be ready for him when he comes. And the book is to prepare us for his coming. And so these three themes, peace, a call to a holy life, and the second coming, they're all intertwined. And Paul, at the end of the book here, is kind of... Summing all that together. Now, verse 24 is encouragement in this. Back in chapter 5, 24, when he says, The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. He's faithful. You can depend on him. You can depend on him that you are you, at his coming. You don't have to wonder if, if you're in Christ, you don't have to wonder, well, I wonder what, what status. He says, God is, is faithful. Now, I'm just going to real quickly go through the rest of these verses, but that's the main focus of what I wanted to say, what I think this passage is saying. He, he's, once again, this is the last shot, is the end of the book, that he, I want you to focus on peace, a call to a holy life, and being ready when Christ comes again. Verse 25 is a request for prayer. He says, brothers and sisters, pray for us. And that's the Apostle Paul saying that. Verse 26 is uh, the kiss greeting there when he says, greet all God's people with a holy kiss. And he normally ends his letters that way. There, uh, there's some things we can say about that. We don't have time to go into that. But uh, notice he describes it as a holy kiss. And some have said, well, he has to say that because be people kissing each other and it's unholy kiss. It's not, not uh, the right kind of kiss. But probably the emphasis he's talking about is it's a holy kiss because you're holy people. It's a greeting. It's a kiss that you share among yourself because you're God's people. I mean, everybody, the, 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 kiss, he's t the kiss here was a normal way of greeting. So everybody in first century did that. But he says, this is a holy kiss because you are holy people. You are God's people. It also, it goes a little bit deeper than that, the idea, because you have unity among each other. You all belong to Christ. So it's more than just encouraging them to greet one another. It's challenging them. If you have hostility, you have disunity, you need to, you need to work that out because you're God's holy people. And you share this holy greeting, this holy kiss. Verse 27, he wants the letter read. And that's the way that in first century they would have heard the letter. They didn't have Bibles. By the way, they wouldn't have stood up and read one verse and said, okay, well, it's about 12 o'clock. We got to stop today. They would have stood up and somebody read the entire letter, unrolled the scroll, read the whole letter from the Apostle Paul. And... He is saying, I want this read. I ch and in fact, it's strong language there. I charge you to read this. And then we come to the very last verse 
verse 28, and it's a grace benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. As I mentioned before, letters had a format. Secular letters of the first century commonly closed with um, farewell, I hope things go well with you, be strong, prosper. That's not what Paul does here. What he does is he focuses their eyes and our eyes on grace, on God's grace. It's not just be strong, it's may God's grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And so that's, grace is, we can't earn grace and, and we can't just be strong on our own. It's dependent upon God's grace. So as we've been through this letter, I've had, I, I didn't make that, but I found it somewhere. It's preparing for the coming king. He may come today. He may come in the next moment or so. Maybe a while. We don't know. But what this letter is to do is to prepare us for his coming as we live peaceful lives, as we live holy lives, and as we're anticipating that coming. So we're going to sing the song that Stephen announced, 767, Who at the Door is Standing. If you're not a Christian, we call you to be prepared to become prepared this morning as you repent you confess the name of Jesus and you're baptized into Christ you're raised up to live this holy life if you've done that and you wandered away can you say you're living a holy life not a perfect sinless life because none of us can do that but a holy life devoted to him can you say you're doing that if you're living in sin, you're not doing that. The good news, and again, it's focus on grace, is that there is this invitation today from God. And it's our plea, it's our prayer, that if you need to come to be right with God, that you'll do it this morning. Because Christ could come today. And it's our prayer, if you need to come, you'll do that while we stand and while we sing.